you are a former Navy SEAL and an artist. I've never heard of this before. Me neither. <laughs> so there's so much to your story. Let's start back at the beginning. Um, you spent a lot of time out of the country mm -hmm. as a kid. Mm -hmm. And tell me about that, just a, just okay. a little bit about that and yep. your faith as a kid. Okay. So at the age of eight, my family uh, or my parents were called to be missionaries in Southeast Asia. So at the, uh, I was about to turn eight years old. My brother was 10. My little sister was six. And uh, we moved to Southeast Asia where that's where I grew up. And in the village that I lived in, it was very, very rural. It was just on the, the border of the Himalayas. And and there's a huge language barrier and nobody there spoke any English. We were the only white people. And so I didn't have any way to communicate as a young kid with the, the kids that were around me. And so uh, at the time, my brother and sister and me, we were going to like the public education system. And it was really, really challenging. And the only way that I could really communicate with other people was like drawing. Mm -hmm. And so I found drawing like Sonic the Hedgehog or, you know, Dis whatever Disney character was really the only way that I could interact with the, the kids around me that and like play outside, you know, and, and most time at school isn't spent playing outside. So um, I took to drawing and I just picked it up. I, I really enjoyed it. So I found myself drawing, you know, in the mountains outside or our house or different animals or whatever. And and I just kind of fell in love with it. And that was just kind of my outlet. And it was one of those things that as I progressed throughout the years in, in my education, it was something that uh, I was recognized as being good at. And the teachers were like, wow, you're really good at art. Or, you know, my teacher said, hey, your doodles are a little bit too detailed and your grades are suffering. So maybe like dial mm -hmm. back on the doodles and, and focus more on your math. Uh, but it was something that I knew that I loved. I just didn't know how, you know, we didn't have the internet in the early 2000s or well, I guess we did, but it wasn't what it is now. So there's really no way for me to know how to pursue a career as an artist or anything like that. And there was really no encouragement for my family to, to be an artist. And uh, my father served in the military before and um, before we went to the mission. And that seemed like kind of the next logical step if it wasn't going to be something artistically related. So that's kind of the direction I went. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Sorry if I rambled. No. Uh -huh. So um, you're back in the States. I, mm -hmm. I did a little bit of, of research. So um, I know that when you came back, it was hard for you to come back as well. It's hard for you to be there yeah. non-speaking. And sure. then it's hard for you to come mm -hmm. back because you're not fitting in. Right. Well, yeah. So, you know, when you're on the mission field, you'll spend so much time overseas and then you'll get like a furlough. So you might come back for, to the States for six months to a year um, just to like recoup, visit family and spend some time in the States or my, maybe my parents had to do some training or something. So my freshman year in high school was the first year that I moved back for like a year. And it was a huge culture shock moment. We were in, uh, you know, Southern Alabama. And it's just a very different environment from where I grew up overseas you know and uh so definitely experienced some bullying just you know the, the weird kid from asia and and you just don't know how to again you know i don't really know how to communicate with the people around me a lot of my friends are driving i i don't know how to drive i i don't have any of the experience that any of these kids have so my, my childhood was just so different um than a lot of these other folks and uh, you kind of stand out when when you live a different life like that so definitely some some challenges there and so you kind of feel like a you know a kid that doesn't fit anywhere so raise your hand you know. if you felt like a kid that didn't fit in <laughs> yeah so uh, and the you know the wonderful thing about that is my i had the great privilege of growing up in a christian home and uh just recognizing that you know i'm an alien anyway so it doesn't really matter where i'm at and what struggle i'm going through i know that my kingdom is in the kingdom of heaven and and uh one day he's gonna split the sky open and come back and so i'm just trying to do my best to make it here if i can like he's like his will awesome so you decided to take the easy route and become a Navy SEAL. Yeah, definitely <laughs> more reasonable. Route so there's something, there is something in you. There is a, a natural gift the Lord has given you that wants to go extreme, extreme, right? <laughs> yeah. And and has always been there. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of my wife jokes with me because it's like I'm all or nothing. You know, okay. I've never done like a diet or a fast or anything. But if I am, I'm like, I'm doing three months, you know, and she's like, well, slow down there. Let's see, maybe not. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I am definitely kind of all or, all or nothing. And 
And I, when I came back to the States for college, you, you want to go to the military thing? Sure. A little bit. Yeah. When I came back to the States for college, I did uh, Army ROTC for a couple of years. And when you first show up, the, the usual question that goes around is like, oh, what do you, why do you want to join the military? And every, you know, one person stands up at a time and they're like, oh, I need the experience. And another person's like, oh, I, you know, it's free college. And another guy stands up and says, well, my dad's in the military, so I kind of want to go in the military. And I'm thinking, man, where are all the guys that like want to do, you know, want justice and they want to serve their nation and, and they want to fight bad people and protect good people. And uh, <clears throat> to me, I felt like this deep sense of like justice, like I wanted justice and I wanted to rescue the oppressed and I wanted to help the poor. And so I was like, where, where are the people that really want to be here for the job? And, and I thought, okay, well, whatever's the hardest thing possible, whatever is the most challenging uh, pipeline to go through, whatever or hardest training pipeline, um, whoever comes out at the end of that is probably the people that really, really want to do that job. And so I looked online, I was like, hardest training in, you know, military. And the Navy <laughs> SEAL showed up. And I was like, all right, well, I guess that's, those are my people. So that's kind of the route that I ended up taking. So did they become you? Yeah, in a way, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I remember one day we were doing some training and one of the instructors said, uh, we had just, we had come back from a short Christmas break and we, it was one of the first training evolutions. And the instructor was like, Hey, when you guys went home, was it kind of awkward hanging out with your old friends? And everybody was like, yeah. And they're like, yeah, the more time that you spend here, it, like the more that you have in common with those people in those buildings, he's talking about the, the SEAL teams than you do at the people back home. And so it's kind of one of those things where like the more you're uh, insulated in an environment, you the more you kind of are taken into that group and it, it's caught it's almost a cautionary tale as well because that can go that can go sideways right it's like uh what is the bible verse it's um bad company corrupts good morals you know what i'm talking about yes. something like that anyway um so you have to go in with a you know a sense of identity and recognize that like your identity isn't in whatever job you're doing as much as it is like you know, who the Lord has opened up for you to impact in, in what environment. How so, old are you at this point? I'm 22. And you have a faith that's already really, really rooted in, in your identity in Christ at that point? Uh, I would say, yeah, yeah, I was absolutely like a, a diehard Christian, wow. but sanctification is a process, yeah. right? So I've, I've matured a lot even since um, that process. And, you know, you start, you know, you get married and you start having kids and that brings on a whole another uh, group of issues, uh, especially in that job. So, um, but yeah, at that time I was like, you know, I was very excited to be a SEAL and there's definitely, there's a little bit of ego that comes in with, you know, uh, taking on that level of responsibility at such a young age. And so you get a little bit of confidence in you and then the Lord lets you get married Kids, <laughs> and all of it gets the great yeah. <laughs> yeah, they don't listen to you like your buddies do. No, they don't. <laughs> um, so, when you were overseas, when you were a SEAL, you weren't doing any art, but you were creating and you were using potentially, you were yeah. creating something. Yeah, right. Have you thought about it? Have you thought about what you were creating and what are the traits that you're using now for your art that you were actually using then? And it's now just transferred into your art form. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did this uh, interview with Newsmax and it was really funny because the, the lady that interviewed me, she's like, art, you know, I, there's not a lot of Navy SEALs who like art. And uh, I was like, well, sort of, we love art. We just collect it on our bodies instead of on our you know, on canvases or something because we're all tattooed. You know, everybody has tattoos. And that's how I got like, a, you know, David and uh, Deadline and all this stuff because they're talking points, you know, and if I can talk about David and the lion and Goliath and, you know, how God's prepared him from a young age to eventually fight giants and uh, rule kingdoms, then I can talk about how Jesus does that. So your us. body so, as so, yeah, visual so I'm trying to use my body as visual gospel. talking points for sharing the gospel. But oh, the, uh, so but the, but, you know, there are like guys are very creative. I, I, a lot of seals that get out, they go into entrepreneurial worlds and art is very, I mean, it's, you're an entrepreneur, you're trying. It's great. The, uh, yeah. So, 
um, you are engaging, like, you know, everybody's trying to come up with a patch or uh, a logo that represents kind of their culture and their platoon. And um, so there's visually, branding. Oh, there's branding <laughs> for sure. Every platoon you go to, there's like, we're getting t shirts, you get hats and patches okay. and this whole thing, <laughs> you know, and everybody, uh, you're very judged, like, you're judged on how you present yourself and how you look as an operator. One of the first indicators of like who's professional is you can judge them by how they wear their equipment, right? If your magazines are placed or, you know, where you put stuff, is it sloppy? Is your gear damaged? Do you take care of yourself? Uh, because if, if you have a good, uh, you know, if you, if you present yourself and you're professional in the way that you, you take care of your equipment, um, you typically that leaks over into oper operations. So, um, you judge everything, but appearance and aesthetic is very important as well. Okay. So, that's really, that that's your no, question. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's I very interesting. The... I don't know that. I think that's really fascinating because I'm, I'm always thinking of how it correlates to our, our own experience mm -hmm. and that concept of um, how you present yourself. It, it may not be fair, right? It may not be fair that right. people judge you so quickly, but people who are in um, creative art forms, people do judge you. Well, we yeah. judge each other daily. Yeah, you're, I mean, you're judged by your artwork. You're judged by the kind of canvas that you paint on. You're judged by the, the type of, you know, glass that you blow. Like it, what quality, um, what quality materials are you using? You know, are you planning just for something that you're going to use once and discard it? Or am I trying to create, use pigments and canvases that are going to last for centuries? You know, how am I, am I preparing myself for longevity as opposed to in my the future generations, as opposed to just what am I, what am I doing today? And so, you know, guys are always thinking, they're not just thinking about this stuff for themselves, the ease of use. Like it could be as easy as how you draw a magazine to replace your gun. Guys are always trying to think, okay, what can make me faster? You know, like I'm going to redesign the entire way we use magazine. I'm going to wow. tilt my magazines 45 degrees to make it, you know, 0.25 seconds faster. And so you're always thinking about this, not just for yourself to make yourself faster, but like, you know, future operators might, this might change the way future operators work. And so think about, um, you know, I doubt, I, I doubt Bugaro or NCY if we're painting and thinking about Justin Hughes and how they, I, they might inspire their work. Um, but innovating and thinking about the future, I think is a very important aspect to you know, you know, creating and professionalism. I want to say um, this last week was Veterans Day. Thank you for your service. Thank you, you as Thank you for your support. Uh, I am fascinated with how you went from Navy SEAL to becoming a full-time artist. That I, I've not connected the dots. I've yeah, not heard that I know, story. Me neither. <laughs> I'm just I don't know how I have to yeah. So, all right, yeah. you get home. You've got, you have to have a transition point. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, we, we have to kind of backtrack a little okay, bit. Please. So, I was, uh, as an operator, uh, it was like 14 days before my first deployment, I had my first born son. And then uh, three months before my second deployment, my, we had twins. And I'm living on San, in San Diego, all of our families at, all over the place. So we have no help. It's just my wife. She's handling everything. She's holding down the fort at home. And uh, <clears throat> I was going to do a third deployment. But, you know, I'm talking to my wife on my second deployment. She's like, maybe can we do something else where you're home a little bit more often? So you can be around the kids and, and help out. And it's like, yeah, we can, we can do something like that. So I took a job as an instructor and I was teaching young bud students how to you know, be Navy SEALs. Okay. And, uh, and I got to have a lot more time at home with the kids, but I also got to kind of do some things that I had kind of neglected for a long time. And I had drawn platoon logos and stuff, but I never really painted um, before. Uh, I was really into pen and ink at, when I was you know in high school and stuff, but um, I had completely, you know, neglected actually attempting to do produce really quality artwork. And uh, at one point when I was instructing, I went into one of my boss's offices and he had this big statue. So the Navy SEAL Trident, is anybody familiar with that insignia? It's an eagle and uh, it's holding a trident and a flintlock pistol and there's like an anchor. And it's a gold emblem that we put on, you put on your chest when you're a Navy SEAL and it's kind of like the Navy SEAL insignia. And he had like a big statue of it in his office and it was 3D. It looked like a real eagle. It was really, really cool. I said, that's awesome. 
but there's no way my wife's going to let me put that in the house. And there's no way I, I, my office isn't big enough to put it in my office. I said, what if I painted it? Because you, you go into museums, I think I was in a museum a week before, and you see all this stuff, and you're like, I could do that. Mm-hmm. Nah, that's not that good. I could do that. <laughs> and so I was like, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I'm actually going to try to paint something. And so I went to the craft store on the way home, picked up a, a couple acrylics, and, you know, I don't know what I'm looking at, uh, in, a, in a canvas. And I, while my wife's watching Netflix one night, I try to paint this you know, trident, the living trident. I, I go online, I look up pictures of eagles and I look at, you know, ain't na- old Navy anchors and flintlock pistols. And I can, hey guys, what's up? Uh, I kind of compile these, these images into, you know, a realistic version of this insignia. And I bring it into my office and I put it up, you know, next to my computer. And one of, yeah, come on, one yeah, of my come buddies, on. one of my buddies like, hey, where'd you get that? I said, oh, I painted it. He said, you painted that? I said, I painted it. He's like, you didn't paint that. I said, I painted it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, he said, where can I get one of those? I said, I don't know. I, I don't really want to paint another one. And he said, well, let me get a print of it. I said, I don't know how to do that. He said, take a good picture of it. Uh, tell me whatever it costs and I'll give you some extra. And I said, well, how much? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I've never done any of this before. He said, here's a hundred bucks. And so he gave me a hundred bucks. I was like, oh, sweet, a hundred bucks for a picture. And so I had prints made of it and I gave it to him on a canvas and he put one at home. And then, you know, two weeks later, I have a line of, you know, 20 seals outside my door trying to get these prints. And my wife's (laughs) taking orders and I got like stacks of these things in the house. (laughs) And there's months where I'm making more selling prints than I was as a Navy SEAL, which is pretty out of of control. Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge blessing. And so it was the first time I was like, dude, people can do this as a business. This is pretty awesome. And then the seed was in my head. Like I would love to do this one day, you know, Mm -hmm. professionally. And uh, it it was in the back of my head. And I said, you know, if, if the Lord will work it out, I'm going to walk with my hands like this. Um, I wasn't at that time pursuing an art career, but I knew uh, getting out of the teams and we don't have to get too personal, but I was in, you know, I was an instructor in Buds and the lifestyle is very rigorous. You're gone a lot. So you get home and you're, you don't know your kids, your wife barely, you know, is hanging by a thread. You're kind of like, this isn't really sustainable. Not for me. I couldn't balance the, the idolatry of the job that I had. I love the SEAL teams. I could do it till the day I died. But I knew that if I stayed in, that would take priority over my family. And I, that's not the man that I, I didn't join as that guy. And I didn't want to leave as somebody else. So I wanted to leave as the same man that I joined as. And, and so I made the decision like to transition out of the military. And uh, I stayed in the reserves for three years. So I was still kind of in the community. And I knew that if something really bad happened, I could get back in and, and assist if, if possible. But uh, for the most part, I was ready to kind of transition out and do something else. I just didn't know quite what that looked like. Am I going on too long? No, you're making oh, no, So anyway, so I, so I got out of the, um, I, I got out of the military and I got, a, uh, I was actually working at Blackbot for, uh, I worked like, at Blackbot. Oh, did you really? When did you because that, yes, we were, we hired, um, for people right out of the Navy a lot. Me. So anyway, yeah. So yeah. So I got a job at Blackbot, and I was working there for like ten months. But I would do like I show up at nine, I get back at five, and I paint till two, three o'clock in the morning, and then I do the same thing over and over. And I, you know, I never had uh, social media. I was really even still. I hate social media, and it's like the bane of my existence. And I really struggled to do anything publicly, but. Um, you get enough pressure from your, your spouse and, and the way that the <laughs> business world works, you realize this is how it is. You've got to market yourself. And so I got a social media, I started posting and, you know, I'd paint something and it'd sell and then I'd paint something and then, you know, you'd tell a price and they'd be like sold. And I'd be like, Dang, I should ask for more, you know, or, or something <laughs> like that. and so it got to the point where uh, I was making enough that I would take a huge pay cut, but we could pay the bills. Uh, we crunched the numbers and we're like, all right, I think we can do this. And so we made the transition um, to pursue art full time. My wife works about 20 hours a week um, and she homeschooled. She's still a superhero. Um, she's awesome. But uh, yeah, we, we get by now as uh, doing the full time art thing. Um, I write and I do art. But there was a year that I stopped writing and trained for a marathon. Jeez. And the, the I can't I don't run anymore, but. That year, um, I realized the same energy that I was putting in the novel writing and creative work was the very same yeah. uh, effort that would put me on the street for hours every day. Right. Um, 
do you find that it's a seamless transition that sort of drive to put it the hours of work into your work? Yeah, I would say like I could I don't think I could have ever been an artist before I was a Navy SEAL because mm-hmm. I I think the the patience that I had as an operator and trusting a process and knowing that it's like, I'm going to be garbage. I'm going to be terrible at something for a while and being okay with just like sucking for a while. Um, and just looking at my problems and my, the things that I struggle with and confronting them and then like addressing them and building on them. So <clears throat> without those tools for me, and a lot of people have to work that out the hard way and they struggle and they, you know, they, it takes a lot more time to learn those lessons. I can learn them really, really quick uh, coming from the SEAL teams. Cause I, you know, I look at my, like the bad paintings I do, I keep in my office, they look right at me um, because I don't want to forget, you know, where I came from and, you know, where I'm, where I'm trying to go. So to, yeah, same energy, um, having that patience and trusting that process uh, for excellence. It's definitely been a huge part of, of that. Two things I want to talk about. I want to touch on that word excellence that you just mm-hmm. said um, and your philosophy on excellence in art. I'm not there yet. Sorry. I don't mean to give you that impression. No, no, no. No, <laughs> no I, your philosophy on uh, art, mm-hmm. art as a whole. I saw an interview yeah. that you had done talking about how, um, you know, the Renaissance is not the right, greatest yeah. ever. Like, right, why yeah. are we not right. making the, why right. can't we make the greatest right. art, the greatest, you know, Mm. that has ever been done Gosh. And, and, okay. and and pair that please with faith uh christian faith okay. and excellence I'll try. as well <laughs> I'm getting a little philosophical i was thinking about this the other day actually because uh you know we're in the age of autom- automation yeah. like our planes and cars are driving themselves with the push of a button uh we have buildings that are being 3d printed uh like you know photography is is like a push button. You can freeze a moment. Um, the creative process seems to be dying. Even, I mean, like the rise of AI, you know, people are creating art with a prompt now. And <clears throat> the creative process, um, to me, there, well, maybe I can tie it in with this. There's a, there's a king of Sparta, and I think it was King Aegis or something, and somebody... Uh, did a demonstration for him of a catapult that could launch this dart like 200 yards away and kill, you know, enemies. And the king said, alas, valor is no more, right? Mm-hmm. Because the further that we remove ourselves from the trauma, right, the further we are from the, the bravery. And so I fi- I've kind of found like a lot of these, like this intuitive, this gritty, uh, meeting of expression in, in, human, you know, uh, human expression onto material creation, right? You're taking oil and pigment and canvas and you're mushing them together to create something that is representation of how you feel or of like of something that you've experienced. And so there's something really raw about that. It also showing it and displaying it is, is an expression of how you feel. That's creation. You know, like all of creation speaks of God, right? We can find wonderful, beautiful aspects of the, the divine, in his creation. And so when we remove ourselves from that in, in society, when we create things or we, we give our creative expression to something else, we lose, like it loses the, the power. And so for me, um, I guess to try to answer your question is like, there's an element of bravery in creation and there's an element of like sacrifice that you have to be okay with giving up, like that you have to be okay with uh, with, so and not take any shortcut. Yeah, you ability. can't take the shortcuts. Yeah, because part of creativity is, you know, being vulnerable. Yeah, exactly. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sorry if that's, I didn't well, that's thought that out too much. So I'm just trying to kind of no, spitfire an answer. Tell me about, um, tell me about your, where you are now. Um, and what, what is the Lord doing in your life right now? And what is he doing in your craft? Um, geez, uh, well, God's constantly working on me. I, at this point, um, I've gotten to the point where, you know, I, even in my artwork, I, I found, 
I have this wonderful experience in the SEAL teams, but part of you still feels like attached, like your identity can be wrapped up into something, right? Uh, so <clears throat> what I would like to see and, and what I think God is doing with me is I'm trying to take all the experience, all the, the things that I've done in the SEAL teams and uh, that trident that I, that I worked really hard for, I worked really hard for, um, and pin it at the foot of the cross. And so my, my hope and by what I found is my joy is, is taking all these things and showing that um, these, are all, these are all gifts from the Lord and that all the greatest things man can do are like nothing compared to the grace and then goodness that uh, Christ has given us on the cross. The most awesome form of masculinity was self-sacrifice. You know, the, the most incredible expression of love was dying for somebody, um, you know, for us. And, and how can I take these things that men resonate with, right? Like we love the movie Braveheart. We love uh, the Patriot. We love watching that stuff. And when we see it, we, we want to be it, but like, but like Christ is so much cooler than any of those things, you know, that it's the coolest expression. And so like, I want to encourage men to see, you know, maybe take some of these elements of stuff that they really appeal to because the, the SEAL teams are an, an actual thing that they can connect with. It's something that's happening in their time. It resonates with them now. And uh, how can I take that and point it? back to what the Lord's already done. Does that make, mm -hmm. does that make sense and answer the question? Yeah. Sorry. And, that, and no, absolutely. That's really what I'm trying to kind of do. No, and we've talked a lot about how um, our identity can become wrapped up in things yeah. and we have to continue daily to lay those things down. Um, and being a creative person, whatever your craft is, right. is also can become an idol. Yeah, I mean, and so you have to, you have to lay that down on a daily basis as well. Um, if you can come up with something, tell me a cool something that the Lord has done through your artwork, through a painting or some connection. Do you, is there something that he's done or maybe yeah. placing you um, to meet somebody and have an impact for yeah. Christ that you wouldn't have? Yeah, I get cool. I mean, the wonderful thing about social media now is there's never been, in my opinion, a better time to be an artist is you can, you have, you have access to your audience, you know, you can find your people pretty quickly. And so, uh, ran one of my maybe first hundred followers is a Marine and he was a combat artist. And we just kind of started messaging each other and talking about art and uh, long story short, he ends up coming to my studio and I did this painting um, of an operator and one of my favorites, um, sorry, if I'm scatterbrained, one of my favorite pieces of art uh, is a statue of David um, by uh, Bernini. And is anybody familiar with Bernini? He's a really incredible marble sculptor. He's like 23 years old doing stuff that, you know, is, is, hasn't been done yet. And so uh, I love this statue because it captures this moment of tension with David right before he slings the stone at Goliath. And so I painted, when I first started painting, I, the biggest piece of advice that I got was, hey, paint in black and white, you know, get an understanding of your values and your in your forms and painting black and white really helps you with that. So I painted a lot of statues when I first started painting. And one of them was that David painting. And the motion, that tension in the statue that he had reminded me a lot of uh, seals when we do like a room clearing and you come through the threshold of the door. So the entryway of the door, it's one of the most vulnerable moments um, of, of uh, clearance. And you have to break down your rifle to make, make room, enough room for you to make entry into the space. And there was that tension in the breaking down of the rifle that really, uh, to me, visually connected with the tension that Bernini created in his marble piece. And so I tried to emulate that tension in a painting with an operator going through the threshold of a door. And in the story of David and Goliath, it says David ran towards Goliath, right? And that seems kind of counterintuitive when a man has a spear and a sword and a shield and you have a slingshot to run at your opponent. And that's exactly kind of, that's a wonderful thing about Christ and, and our God is that when he, he's equipped us with all the things that we need, we don't have to go with timidity and uh, in fear of the obstacle that we're, that we're, that we're uh, trying to conquer. We can step in boldly. We can declare what we're, you know, uh, what we're doing, um, 
with a sense of confidence because the Lord has prepared the way for us. And so uh, I painted this picture kind of as that, that physical representation, like, look, you got all the skills, you got all the things that you need to do right now. So just do the thing, you know, go step, go through the door, go through the threshold, run after the giant. And so my friend who I met on social media when I first started, he brought another Marine in and he wasn't a believer. And I didn't know that because this other guy's a believer. And so I go through that whole story, you know, of like how God's equipped us with this, this skill. And, uh, and, you know, he kind of sat there quietly and then they left. And my buddy CJ, he's like, dude, I just had this great talk. Um, you know, I don't know if you know this, but this other guy wasn't a believer. And he's like, dude, I, I think I'm ready to run after God and, and stop being timid about it. And he's like, dude, cool. Right. Like I didn't know that art could have um, that kind of impact. That story is so important. And I just kind of like, that's what it's all about. You know, that's what, that's what it's all for. And uh, it was just a really, really cool moment for me because um, you know, that's like, if that one person comes to know the Lord through that, the it's painting is worth it. it. Yeah. And, and that's also another, it's, it's a testament to, uh, the importance for artists to be able to speak about your work as well. I, I know that there's like a saying, you guys have probably heard this, like when a writer writes a book, he does it. Nobody expects him to illustrate it, but when a painter does a picture, they expect him to be able to talk about it. It's like, well, yeah, you're not writing a book. Like words create and form things. Like God spoke the world into existence. Our, we have a different task as artists. So I think it's important for us to be able to speak about our work and tell the story. Um, it's not enough to me just to be able to, you know, paint the picture. I want to be able to tell the story. I want to have the engagement. I want to have the conversation well, about the piece. Probably one of the reasons why you create representational work as right. opposed to abstract. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe because abstract work, I would say is more of a, I'm creating something and then I'm going to let this other person bring what they'd like to it. Would you okay. guys agree with me? Yeah. Yeah. More collaborative. Uh, it's more of a, it, yeah, it's more of a partnership. I'm doing it. And now you're going to bring your own thing to it. Like reading a, a book as, mm -hmm. but but you are um, you're represent you're actually telling us exactly what you want us to right. see, where you want us to look, and what you want us to feel. So right. a lot, I think, more control right. in representational art. I would like to see because I know that there is a level of ab abstraction even in. I like to look at like the temple as an example because like mm -hmm. it's very <laughs> specific. God literally mm -hmm. gave very mm -hmm. specific instructions about how everything's supposed to be created. The artist is the first person to be filled with the spirit. And so the, there is a level of abstraction in, you know, he's used pomegranate leaves on tassels. And so there's, there's abstract and nuance in his creation that isn't exactly representational, even in the tapestry, the woven cover colors and the fabrics. Um, I haven't really looked into the theology of abstract as much as I have representationalism, but we have some it's very interesting. Yeah, I'm sure that they can sure get into it more than I can. It seems um, to be in opposition, uh, like Navy SEAL and vulnerability, uh, or warrior and right. vulnerability. Yeah. But but you have you. It's as if it's like you. Taboo. Well, it's as if you are. Um, you're really capturing the moment before the moment before or the moment after right like uh, in the works that i've seen you do it's not necessarily yeah, the it's not yeah. necessarily the action yeah. it's the moment before or after um that i think holds um permanence for you yeah that's really interesting i never thought about that thank you <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> i'll have to think about that now <laughs> there's some there's something there so this is very i i feel very different and it's kind of funny that you say that now because i'm like yeah this is like a moment before something happens yeah, no it's so interesting now i gotta think up, yeah. pick the, i i think to a certain extent out there with all yeah totally well i i resonated because like i grew up in rural you know mountains and in the wilderness and like david was a shepherd you know he lived in the wilderness and then like he kind of happened into this warrior position where he's killing giants and like I felt like well that's kind of like me I didn't really know I'd want to be a Navy SEAL like I knew I wanted to serve to some capacity I was interested in that but I didn't know I'd be doing that on that level you know and then also just in home like the guy's home life was a wreck you know and in my I, I, by the grace of God mine wasn't quite as bad as David's was you know but uh yeah certainly like I'm trying to figure out my kids and my wife and um, the tension between, you know, work and family. And so his story really resonated a lot with me, but, the, um, 
there, there's one specific story maybe that, that it really hit me home was uh, I just come back from deployment and I was like, man, I don't understand. I can get in a gunfight for six hours and I can be cool as a cucumber. I can laugh with my friends, you know, as bullets are literally like impacting around me. But the moment my kids are all screaming and yelling, I lose my mind. You know what I, mean? like, I am like furious. Like, why isn't anybody listening? And I talked to my, uh, one of my guys in my community group and I was telling him the story and he was a very wise man. And he told me the story of David and Nathaniel. And you know the story of uh, when David uh, sends off, uh, what's his name, um, uh, Uriah, oh, Uriah yes. off to war, and he steals his wife, right? And Nathaniel tells him, he's like, hey, he, he, if there was a shepherd, right, and he had all these sheep, but he wanted like this one sheep, right? This other shepherd, he had one sheep, and he took care of it, and it slept in his house, and ate from his table, and then like he killed that guy's sheep instead of uh, one of his own sheep, and David's like, you know curse him, whatever, you know, he deserves to pay him a hundredfold or whatever. Anyway, Nathaniel says, you are the man, you know, he doesn't say you are like him. You are, you know, your story is similar. He said, you are the man. And it's kind of one of those things like no matter what, um, no matter how much I justify how good I am under stress or in combat situations or what I've been trained for, like at the end of the day, like my heart is angry. You know, I have a, I have a wickedness in my heart and it's, it is at my children. It doesn't um, like I am an angry man. I have to confront my sin. I have to confront my brokenness. And so to me, like David resonated with me. I was like, dude, this guy, like he's hearing the same thing I'm hearing thousands of years later, you know, and like that just struck me to the core. And so I love to play on biblical uh, imagery. I painted that big, well, it's not there anymore. But that big canvas is a five foot by seven foot painting of like David's Shiana. mighty men. And uh, it's kind of a modern take on, on the story. But yeah, I definitely resonate with uh, David's story quite a bit. And it, it's just easy for me to paint for some reason. And it's a self-portrait, right? It's a trip. Yeah. You. Uh, yeah. And I can talk about, yeah, and two other um, guys. Okay. But I'm, I'd be happy to talk about that painting okay. in a second. Right. But as far as this, did I answer your question? Yes. I'm sorry. If I, I, yes. I can wrap it trail. Um, title of this painting? I don't know. I, it's kind of like a Psalm 23. It's okay. like a, it's, it's, it's inspired by the Psalm. Um, and I was speaking about it earlier. It, David is kind of presented as a Christ figure in the Bible. He's by no means a, a deity, but he was later a king. And uh, all the pictures of David that I see, he's always like so, you know, soft or he's standing on a giant's head. It's either, you know, soft shepherd boy or like guy standing on giant or pulling giant head, you know. And I kind of wanted to capture this serene and serene moment, but also in the intensity of, you know, a future king. And so I put I painted the tree. It's almost like lightning, you know, coming like a throne and. And he's sitting there with his, his flock around him, but also trying to engage the viewer. Um, it's not, I wanted there to be a little bit of motion. He's not playing the lyre. It looks like he's about to set the lyre down and he's stepping down. And the sheep are in a moment of like alertness on the left and on the bottom right, you can see one looking at you. It's almost like you are, you're the, the threat, right? you know? Right. And so um, it's like, I guess almost like a challenge, like, are you the flock or are you the, are you in the, are you in the flock or are you a goat, you know, or a lion? And uh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of bring the viewer into it and maybe capture a, a more kingly shepherd than, uh, than what I usually see. Yeah. So when I did this piece um, to me now, I, I've gotten to the point where if I have a good, if I have a good reference or good concept of a piece, the canvas, this is just like hours in the studio. You know, the painting isn't so fun for me anymore. I get really excited about the creative aspect, like composing the image. And I'm, I'm learning a lot about how terrible I am at design. And so I'm challenging myself to try to like kind of come up with more compelling compositions. And so the creation of the work is kind of taken more of a uh, enjoy. It's more enjoyable to me than actually painting the product itself. Interesting. Um, I painted that, that picture uh, of essentially three m mighty men or modern operators presenting the cup to the viewer, right? Because we've all been given that cup. We, all, we have all been given something uh, by God and you can drink it 
for yourself. You can take it um, and use it selfishly or you can pour it out as an offering. And so I painted the picture, but what I didn't realize was three months later is that uh, in um, on October 7th, there'd be this huge attack in, um, in Israel. And, and I had a huge problem with that painting via social media. So the men are wearing menorahs. They're wearing patches with the, the, you know, the symbol of the temple. And I, the concept there was, you know, we are the temple now. Um, the, the body of Christ, the people are the temple. And, and um, it, had a, it had a really hard impact. But that's probably the only time where I've been like, dude, what crazy timing that I'm, I draw this, you know, biblical story. And I, they kept taking the picture down and I was fighting on a uh, fighting with social Facebook or whatever on it. And they said, well, you know, it's very, um, the guys are holding guns and it's a very sensitive time right now in Israel. And so we don't want to have anything, you know, that's problematic or might offend somebody. And so it was kind of one of those things for me where it's like, I don't know. I, I'm just trying to be obedient and whatever, you know, the believer or however it speaks to the, the Christian, which is really what I want. Um, you know, my hope is just to encourage uh, a level of holiness, right. And obedience to what God's going to do. do. So I think, I think there's been a big uh, push on. Uh, <clears throat> we have everybody's thinking about our country and all the things that we need to do to fix our country, but nobody's really focusing on fixing their own problems and a a personal level of holiness um, and obedience that Christ wants us to have, you know, be be only as I'm holy. And I think if a lot of believers started focusing more on that, uh, we'd see a bigger change, huge change in this country uh, and especially in the church. I, I found like I'm super blessed in that I have a thing, right? I know like th- this is something I'm super, super passionate about. I'd say I'm as passionate and obsessed with, uh, with the art stuff as I am with the teams. Um, like I love learning. I fall asleep at night watching YouTube videos on how to do stuff differently. <laughs> like I'm into it, you know, and uh, I, I approach it the same way that I approach my, my career as a SEAL. And um I, a lot of guys don't have that. Like a lot of guys are getting out and they're like, I need to make this much money. So I'm going to get a job doing whatever it takes to make this amount of money for my, my family to be stable. And, and I'd rather just walk around like whatever the Lord provides, I'll take it. But like, this is where I feel the God, God's put my heart. These are the gifts that he's given me. And I just want to be obedient. And so, um, to be fair I, though, you yeah. were able to, you're, you didn't have to completely set that life aside. You totally. actually yeah. get to embrace exactly. it in yeah. your life now. And I think that's the missing component. To, to yeah. an extent, yeah. but but there's lots of seals. I, uh, you know, there's many aspects to this job. And there's many, have you guys ever, I'm sure many people in here have heard of Jocko Willink. Very yeah. public fig, figure, big seal guy. He, he came up with a book called Extreme Ownership. And he takes aspects of the seal teams, principles that are common to every seal. Every seal knows them well. And he applies them to business, act, like the business acumen. And uh, there are very great principles in the SEAL teams. There are many uh, things that you can take from the teams and apply them to virtually any environment. So I think that you can embrace aspects of that, you know, warrior aspect. Like I said, many SEALs are entrepreneurial. It's very, uh, being an entrepreneur, starting your own business, it's combat, man. Like it's like your family's on the line. Your house is on the line. You have a, a lot to risk if you fail. And so I think that there's an element to um, that every SEAL can get out and they can transition and apply those principles. But I think they're missing something that's purpose, right? Like the purpose in the in this country, we've idolized our constitution. Constitution's fallen apart. Um, it's it's subjected to man's interpretation. Uh, we we study it. We try to do the best we can uh, with the, the information that we have about our founding fathers. But at the end of the day, it's not divine. The Bible is a, it's a divine creed. It is inspired and uh, it's an inspired document, second Timothy three sixteen. you know, breathed out by God. Um, if you're not grounded in the word, if your purpose isn't grounded in the Lord, like, of course you're going to be miserable. Right. And it's so easy to like, the pro- I feel like a problem with a lot of veterans is it's like you have such an identity in this country. You have such a, a grounding in our constitution and the ideas that this country is established. But dude, the kingdom of heaven, 
Like it's unchanging. Like the Lord is, he's King now forever and will be, and will remain our rules and our laws in this nation will change. They're subject to change and you're going to get depressed when it's, it's messed up and all that you fought for comes crumbling down. Like, of course, yeah, it's going to be very, very hard for you to ground yourself or root yourself in anything in, in your business. So you got to stake it on, you know, take all that stuff and put it at the feet of the cross. And I think that's really the, what's missing. It's like, it's Jesus. Yeah, really. What advice would you have for this group of like yeah. mixed creatives and all the different facets that we're doing, all the different, all the different seasons of our lives? What what might you uh, say for us? Uh, cling to God always. Uh, when I first was a bud student, it was this really cool. Uh, it was, I think it was like Fourth of July weekend, right before my buds class started, uh, and the training was really a big deal. I was super nervous. And my brothers, I actually went through buds with my brother. He ended up quitting. But we were walking down the streets of Coronado. And my brother could talk about anything. Like, he knows something about everything. And there's this girl walking next to us with a dog. And he's like, oh, I like that breed. That was a whatever, whatever, hunting something. She's like, yeah, my dad's a big, you know. And they go into this huge conversation. She's like, well, hey, my family's having this 4th of July, you know, get together. Why don't you guys all come? Um, since I know you're in the military because you're all shaped heads and everybody in the town knows what blood students are, you know, she's like, come over. My dad's a pastor. We'd love to have you guys for dinner. And so we go over there we have dinner with them and the dad's kind of sitting there talking to us. Like, you know, I've known a lot of guys that go through the program. We have family members that are SEALs. He's like, why don't you guys come to our hotel tonight and you can watch the fireworks from our hotel. I'd love to drive you guys to talk. We were driving over the, the bridge of Coronado. And I remember him saying like, Hey guys, listen, this is going to be the, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges you have in your life. And the only advice I, I can ever to give to anybody during the time of challenge is cling to God, you know, just look, look to what Christ is doing and what he's done and, and just put your hope in him. Cause it, it might not work out the way that you, you think, but um, in all things cling to him. And, and I've kind of like, you said, it's like, that's I'll anthem, take it. man. Cling I'll to take the it. Lord. I'll take it. Yeah.